Hello. As chair of staff parish relations committee, I have several tasks. One of those is to let the congregation know of changes in staffing within our church. Several years ago, the Reverend Dr. Margaret Click retired for the first time. At the end of June next month, our pastor Peggy will be retiring for the second time. I'm here today to let you know that, and between now and the end of June, I will be in touch with you, with the SBR committee, and with the district superintendent's suggestions as to staffing for our church. We will let you know who our new pastor will be beginning July 1st. Thank you.
missed um, terribly. You have the worship in front of you that I will send out Saturday night, and I invite you to um, speak the words along with me. Come, Holy Spirit, ignite our hearts with joy and confidence, for God has done wondrous things for us. Come, Holy Spirit, be with us today. Help us to boldly proclaim Christ risen. Amen. And then let us join together in our opening prayer. God of wind and fire, embolden us this day to receive your power. Help us to proclaim the wondrous things that you have done and continue to do in our lives. Give us strength and courage to share the good news of your love and your presence. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn is Spirit Song, so you will hear Beth playing and Pat singing, and um, maybe George, but I'm going to spare you me singing. So, Spirit Songs number 347 in your hymnal. If you have the order of worship, you have the words. Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, 
and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Now this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the reading from our New Testament um, lesson. I turn now to the Gospel. It's John 7, 37 to 39. It is not actually a Pentecost reading, but you will understand when I read it, what it has to do with this situation. On the last day of the festival, that is, the one that became Pentecost, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, Out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the Spirit, which believers in him were to receive. For as yet there was no Spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. That is the end of our readings. May God aid us in our understanding and ability to live accordingly. Now, we're going to honor our graduates. You received um, a list of the graduates with their pictures and a little um, bit of info on each one. Some you will recognize readily. Others are part of the family of faith. And figure out how they um, are here. The first one is Savannah Wright. We all know Savannah. We all love Savannah. We love her voice. She comes to sing. And she um, has now graduated from the University of Maryland with a BS in Biological Sciences and a concentration in Microbiology. She's going to take a year off and find a job in her field and apply to pharmacy school to earn a farm D, pharmacy D, it's called farm D. She's looking into a Navy commission scholarship to support her pursuit of the farm D. She was a member of the National Honor Society all her years at Maryland, and a member of Maryland Discourse from freshman through junior year. Maryland Discourse is dedicated to providing a space for the University of Maryland students to discuss and debate political and social issues. Savannah's been working with the University of Maryland Police Auxiliary since her freshman year and was promoted to student police aide supervisor in August of 2019. In your um, little blurb, the last thing I said, note she uses her voice to praise God. Then Robin Zentz, also one of the young people of our church, she graduated from the University of Maryland with a degree in architecture and a double minor in real estate development and construction project management. Rowley's in an honor society called Tall Sigma, which was for transfer students because she went somewhere else her first year. She was on the dean's list for the architecture school every semester. She will be working at Lozuto starting in July. And Riley's skills led her to seek a career in the construction industry focusing on project management. Her goal is to one day become a project manager 
for large multifamily housing projects, combining her love of design and love of construction into a long lasting career. Riley is the daughter of Rick and Beth Sense and the sister of Caroline and Casey. She's pictured with her new puppy, which you can't see here, but um, a three month old Bernese mountain dog named Bodie, whose feet are about that big around. He's going to be a big boy. And I forgot to say that Savannah is the daughter of um, our IT guy, George, and Joe Smith, and uh, a um, uh, member of uh, Emily. Alex Edwards. He graduated from the University of Maryland with a dual degree in math and aerospace engineering with cum laude honors. He was in the aerospace engineering uh, honor society called Sigma Gamma Tau. You've seen him in worship with Ravi, his girlfriend. He's an Eagle Scout, like Rick said, so they get along real well. Alex's mother is Pat Edwards. He is a triplet, and his brothers are Chris and Matt, which I did not know. Um, in July, Alex will be at Lockheed Martin in Middle River working as a mechanical engineer. And he's pictured with Henry. And if you have the thing in front of you, you see that Henry is the Zentz family golden. Sarah Ann Martin graduated on May 10th, 2020. And though her ceremonies were canceled like so many of them, she is officially an alumna of the University of North Carolina at Capitol Hill. She graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in Public Health and a minor in Chemistry. During her time at Chapel Hill, she was blessed with a group of friends who were second to none. She volunteered as an EMT for a local rescue squad. Sarah has enjoyed working as a research assistant at the UNC Lineberger Cancer Outcomes Program. The next stop in her journey will be Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine where her interests are focused on primary care and women's health. Alex Sabo is graduating magna cum laude, I like saying that, from Washington College. That, by the way, is the top honors you can get. Where he majored in environmental science with minors in public health and Spanish. He was a member of the Presidential Fellows, the Douglas J. Cater Society, the Environmental Science Honor Society, and a also a two-year residential assistant. He also served as parliamentarian, recording secretary, and then president of his fraternity, Kappa Alpha Order. He was a member of the varsity swim team, where he served as captain, and was named to the Centennial Conference Academic Honor Roll. Alex also worked for the Washington College Geographic Information Systems Program. In fall, Alex will begin a graduate program at Virginia Commonwealth University while he will um, pursue a master's degree in environmental studies. Jill Thomas is one of Barbara Brock's two granddaughters. She's graduating from Towson University this month with a bachelor's in deaf studies. She will be attending CCBC at night to earn her interpreter certification. Jill is looking for a summer job to use those skills. And in the meantime, one of her favorite activities is horseback riding at Rockland Breeze Farm in Westminster. Her grandmother says Jill shares the sweetest pit bull, May May, with her sister Erin. Her parents are Lisa and Scott Thomas. Lucas Meering is the grandson of Pat and Donna Rucker and the son of Dana and Charlie Meering. He will graduate from Franklin High this month, and while in school, among other things, he wrestled and he played football. He already owns his own business, a detail business called LM Detailing and Polishing, and will continue to be self-employed at that while he contemplates his future. He may possibly go to a trade school once he makes up his mind. Erin Thomas, one of Barbara Grog's two granddaughters, is graduating from Westminster High School. She plans to attend Carroll Community College and spends a lot of her free time horseback riding also at Rockland Breeze Farm in Westminster. And her grandmother says Erin shares the sweetest pit bull May May with her sister Jill. Erin's parents are Lisa and Scott Thomas. 
and then Amy Davis will be graduating from Spring Grove Area High School in Spring Grove, PA on June 26th um, with a very brief drive-through graduation. So maybe we should figure out exactly what they're doing. Um, she's completed several college level courses and one of her favorite activities has been participation in mock trial competitions. She is currently pursuing an electrical apprenticeship, which is on hold due to the COVID-19 virus. Amy is the granddaughter of Chuck Davis and Elaine Dodds. That's our graduates. No longer the days where you go to school studying home ec and English or things like that. Um, our kids are a super intelligent group of hard-working young people, and we should be very, very really proud of them, whether they are ones who come frequently or who are um, with us through their parents and grandparents. Let us pray. As Pentecost swirls around us, bringing new life and new direction, let your breath fill us with the energy of your spirit and the fire of your enthusiasm. Empower us with the faith to receive your gifts with open arms. In the unity of the Creator of Christ's Spirit, we pray. Amen. And now if you would join me in praying the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is the time where at home you pause to put your money or your IOUs into your collection basket so that uh, you might be uh, giving... Um, back to God what has been given to you and then we're going to join together on um, Spirit of the Living God which is 393 and you have the words here if you know the motions that go along with it please feel free to dance it So you will have a leader. At this point, I don't know 
who, and um, we will continue planning uh, up until the end of June for uh, whatever way we are going to re-enter uh, as church gathered. So thank you. Now, Pentecost Sunday. I always liked the way we could decorate for Pentecost with streamers off of fans and the fans twirling, wearing red. <laughs> I hope you take that um, tradition and on Sunday have red as you are listening to, um, to this. Uh, and decorate your worship space as if Pentecost was right there in your house, because truly it is. In a sense, Pentecost is the most important season for us, other than Christmas maybe, because it gives us the breath of God. And without the breath of God, then we feel like we are alone in the world. But the breath of God is God's presence, is Christ's presence with us wherever we go and whatever we do. And it's ultimately the way God's true peace enters our souls. So here's where the story of Pentecost picks up in the scriptures. Disciples are back in the upper room, waiting and wondering. And some of them are probably grumbling impatiently and nervously like we know we like to do. What in the world are we doing here? All this waiting around and driving me up the wall. There's no use. He's gone and without him we are nothing over. But just as well face it. What is this Holy Spirit business anyway? Maybe we misunderstood him. And just when they get to that point and they're grumbling, a violent wind starts to blow. A mighty wind and images of fire danced around them. A lot of the graphics I see have little flames of fire coming down on top of people's heads. The images danced all around them and pulled them into the activity and the breathing of the Spirit. And suddenly their fear was gone. That it was replaced by peace and confidence and courage and strength and unity. And they began to speak and communicate in ways they had never known they could. And the Word of God boldly and amazingly went to people who were so different in their backgrounds, but who heard and responded. And Scripture tells us that 3,000 people were saved that day. It's interesting to note that there are three classic symbols for the Holy Spirit in the Bible remind us of how God works through us and how God works from the inside out. Breath. The symbol of life. And believe me, when you don't have enough breath, it's hard. Fire, the symbol of power. That's where our energy and our drive comes from. And the descending dove, the symbol of peace. That truly brings us peace. I say it's the most important season in the church year because if we really let the wind and fire and peace of God's spirit work within us, there's no end to what we can accomplish as church, even in the midst of a pandemic. That's a virus. That's not God. Imagine full churches are starting as safely as we can with social distancing. Imagine a world with no poverty. Imagine a world where there's no social injustice, where racism is not something that we live with where people lose their lives simply for being the wrong color. Imagine if the Holy Spirit really did in our lives, or in other words, if we really let the Holy Spirit do in our lives. The kingdom of God would be a reality, and we wouldn't be worried about all those different things. I'm going to tell you a couple stories that I know I've used in other sermons, but I really like them. A little girl was visiting grandmother one beautiful spring morning. No, it's not a story about Zoe, but it could be. They walked out to the grandmother's flower garden, 
And as grandmother was inspecting the progress of her flowers, the little girl decided to try to open a rosebud with her own two hands. But you know what happened. As she would pull the petals open, they would tear or bruise or wilt or break off completely. It didn't open beautifully. And she said, Granny, I just don't understand it at all. When God opens a flower, it looks so beautiful. But when I try, it just comes apart. And grandmother answered, well, honey, there's a good reason for that. God is able to do it because God works from the inside out. We're always trying to manage from the outside in, but instead God works from the inside out. And I think that's the message of Pentecost Sunday. That's what the disciples finally came to understand. His body might not be with them where they could touch him, but he was still with them through the Holy Spirit. And because of the Holy Spirit, with God working from the inside out, they were, due, were able to do much more than they thought they could. It's like the story of the shark and the whale. Both were swimming in the sea when the shark swam up to the whale to start to talk to him. Now, I don't know that sharks and whales know how to communicate. I don't know if it would be safe for them to do it, but this story says that they do. It's a child's story, by the way. And they swam up along together, and the shark said to the whale, You are so much older and wiser. Could you tell me where the ocean is? We all responded, the ocean is what you're in now. And the shark wouldn't believe it. Come on, tell me where the ocean is so I may find it. And the whale repeated, the ocean is here now. You are in it. Unbelieving, the shark swam away, still searching for the ocean. The story has a moral. And I believe the moral is this. Don't spend so much time looking for God. Because the Spirit of God is here and now in our lives, in the midst of the pandemic, in all the social distancing, the shutting away of ourselves that we've had to do, all of those things. God is already with us in the person of the Spirit. And the difference is whether or not we allow ourselves to see it so that we know that we are within the Spirit all the time. And so, even in the midst of this pandemic and with buildings being shut, even of the discussion of when do we come back in and how can we do that safely, even in the midst of murder and mayhem and chaos and rioting, even in all of those and even in unforeseen changes that turn our lives upside down, we have the breath of life that is God-given. So how do we make the most of it? How do we take the fire and the power of Pentecost within us, and then how do we use that to power the world? We have the dove of peace indwelling as well. And how do we claim that peace as an everyday reality? We have it, but like the shark, we know it not. Storms of life come by us all the time, and we fear that we will be swept away. Several years ago, a submarine was being tested and had to remain submerged for many hours. And when it returned to the harbor, the captain was asked, how did the terrible storm last night affect you? And the officer looked at him in surprise and exclaimed, storm? We didn't even know there was a storm. The sub had been so far beneath the surface, surface that it had reached the area known to sailors as the cushion of the sea. And although the ocean may be whipped into huge waves by high winds, the waters below are never stirred. And this, I believe, is a perfect picture of the peace that comes from Christ's spirit. The waves of worry, of fear, of heartbreak can't touch those resting in Christ. Yes, we deal with it, but it doesn't destroy us. And sheltered by His grace, encouraged by His Spirit, the believer is given the perfect tranquility that only Christ can provide. 
So to surrender to God is to open to the spirit within. It is to let the power of Pentecost in our lives. It's to relax into the peace and into the wind and the fire in the world, knowing that it's not us in charge, but God, even when it doesn't seem like it. It's to be shaped by the presence of God again. Have you ever noticed how trees lean in one direction? Depending on how often the wind blows in that direction. I have trees that lean always the same way because when the wind sweeps through my backyard, it hits those trees and moves them. And over time, the power of that wind moves them in a particular direction. When I sit out on my porch and look at things like that, that's where I see God, because in the movement of the wind is where God is, and how we are shaped, which way we lean in the world, has a lot to do with how the wind of the Holy Spirit comes to us. So I'll leave you with this question. Like those trees, do we as a congregation show any evidence of being shaped by the winds of God's Spirit? Is the end of this pandemic when it comes a new opportunity for us to be church and to really be church in the world and get past the things that hold us back? Is the new beginning Pentecostal experience a fresh yet continuing presence in our lives? Now notice here, and this is very important, the Pentecost story in Acts doesn't say everyone start, suddenly started speaking the same language. Pentecost does not destroy the various distinctions between and among people. But the story does affirm that these differences are brought under the binding power of the Holy Spirit. So it's not like we're supposed to be cookie-cutter Christians or cookie-cutter Christians in the world, but we are to let God lead us no matter which direction we lean. Now, Pentecostal power, that's what will help us work our way through the pandemic. That will help us figure out when it is safe for us to come back into the sanctuary, and in the meantime, is there a way to worship outside? And yes, we will hear about other churches opening, but for us, what is right for this congregation has to be the safety of everyone. And since most of this congregation is of the age that um, the um, CDC says are most at risk, and since many of us have all kinds of at-risk um, health issues, we have to be even more careful about how we come back together. Once we know that the entire physical world around us, all of creation, is both the hiding place and the revelation of God, this world becomes home and safe, enchanted in a way, and offering grace to any who look deeply. So I invite us to look deeply once again, to feel God's Spirit moving among us as we decide which way we go from this point on. To God be the glory. Our hymn is number 555, Forward Through the Ages.
We leave this home-centered worship space knowing we do not go forward alone. Ever-present Lord, bless us with the courage to live life as you have taught us to live. And may we be a blessing to others in your name. Hallelujah. Amen.